Alright. So I'll either be going to Western or jumping out that window. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk for about an hour here um, about some of the work I've done with Kepler, and it's a review for many of you because I've worked with so many of you on this topic. Um, and I have to start any topic about cell activity with this quote by Leighton. It says, if the sun did not have a magnetic field, it would be as boring of a star as most of you in the audience probably think that it is. Um, so most people think the sun is just this boring thing that comes up and goes down and makes my tomatoes grow. Um, but actually, it's a fascinating object. So I'm going to spend a lot of time today drawing conclusions between what we see in Kepler and what we see with the sun. And I'll start off with that. Uh, first is a short story about these two phenomena that talk about spots and flares uh, and stellar activity. Okay, so in 1859, uh, an English astronomer, Richard Carrington, was doing his daily observations of the sun. Uh, and he had a little solar telescope that projected on a screen, a little image about 11 inches across on the screen, and he was drawing the patterns of the sunspot. He had been looking at this large spot for about a week, tracing it across the disk of the sun. Um, when he saw what he quotes as a singular appearance, um, of two bright flashes of light, marked A and B here in this diagram. Uh, two bright flashes of light that lit up so bright that he thought that somebody had come and poked holes in his screen. He thought sunlight was streaming in from another room. Some of the light poked holes in the screen. Uh, these two bright flashes of light uh, lit up bright enough that he could see them, and he ran downstairs to yell at his assistant, and by the time he got back, five minutes later, the whole system had moved, um, and in the course of 45 minutes, uh, a region the size of Jupiter had shifted and evolved, and it had started to decay away. And what Richard Carrington had seen was the first solar flare uh, that had ever been observed. Um, so, okay, just to put this in context, this is a big spot. So this is sort of PowerPoint stretched onto the star. This is an image from 2014 of a spot from SDO. So, I mean, it's a big spot, not like biblically large, but it's a big spot. <laughs> um, so that's fascinating enough, and it wouldn't really be warranted to talk about Except for 12 hours later, this massive auroral storm uh, occurred, uh, where people saw a bright red aurora all the way down to Cuba uh, and the Southern Hemisphere. And, and there was reports in the New York Times for several days of ongoing auroral activity uh, that drew people out of the shops, and you could see it uh, in, in the dusk below. This huge, amazing aurora, which inspired this painting by the painter of the church. Um, and this drew this connection between these events we saw here on Earth, uh, first off, they didn't know what the aurora were at that point. There was lots of speculation as to the cause. Uh, and then they knew it was electrically, electrically caused because telegraph lines uh, induced a lot of charge. So people burned their hands, telegraph operators burned their hands uh, while using the telegraphs uh, during this event. Um, and then it drew the connection between these events we see here on Earth that could possibly affect life uh, and what's happening on the sun, this sort of magnetically driven activity. So it raises a lot of important basic questions. How often do these massive spots occur? Um, and how long do they live? Carrington watched this thing for weeks as it moved across the sun and came around again. Uh, how often do these huge flares occur, which seem to be spatially coincident with these big spots? How often do these events occur? And could they affect life? I mean, beyond just burning the foreheads of telegraph operators and um, you know, causing power outages in Canada and things like that, what else uh, might giant flares do? or giant uh, charged particle uh, impacts on the Earth due to light. Um, and then, more generally, what could spots and flares be telling us about the stars? And how did these phenomena change uh, through cosmic time? Um, so these are really basic questions that were prompted by this big event, um, and which still to this day uh, drive a lot of research. 